what I'm excited to talk to you about today is about my favorite topic in the whole world, uh, something that I think is the most important advance for human and civil rights since the Americans with Disabilities Act. We are going to talk about supported decision making and how it can make people's lives better. A lot of you may have heard about supported decision making or SDM as an alternative to guardianship, or maybe you've heard me or someone else speak about it that way. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is a way to use supported decision-making to make people's lives better. If you are a parent, a way to improve the supports and services that your child Please, I needs. can't hear you. If you are a person with disabilities, a way to access more or better supports. If you are a provider or a professional, a way to make your work not only better, but more effective and efficient. So with that in mind, let's me share a screen and we can begin. A moment, please. Having a bit of a technical issue. Can everyone see my screen? Because it's not moving, yes. so I'm going to advance this way. Does everyone see a slide on your screen right now that says, what's your favorite right? Yes. Fantastic. So that's the first question I have for you. As we talk about what supported decision-making is, what I want you to do is think about the rights in your life, the things that are most important to you, the things that make you proudest to be an American, those rights that you would fight to keep. People without disabilities don't think about that very much, so think about it with me today. Think about things like freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of elections and the right to choose things like your life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now think about what all those rights have in common. What they have in common is choice. Choice is what makes rights real. So I always say that my favorite right is the right to make choices because we choose things like what to say with freedom of speech. We choose things like who is going to govern us with freedom of elections. We choose how how and where and whether to worship when we exercise our freedom of religion. So choice makes those rights real, not hypothetical. So when we make choices, that is when we are exercising our rights. Great quote up on your screen from a philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre, who I think gets it right. He says, I am my choices. All of us, we are the sum total of our choices. The choices we made yesterday, today, the good ones, the bad ones, they make us who we are. They shape our lives. So when you hear me talk about the right to make choices, what I'm talking about is something called self-determination. It's a phrase maybe some of you have heard. It's an academic phrase. I don't really love buzzwords. But what self-determination is, is just this. It's making choices. When we exercise our right to make choices, when we direct our lives, when we control our lives, we are being self-determined. And that is a very, very good thing because 40 years of research say this, that when people with disabilities make more choices, when they exercise their rights to make choices, when they are more self-determined, they have better lives. 40 years, study after study after study has shown that people with disabilities making more choices are more likely to be healthier, more independent, better adjusted, better able to recognize and avoid abuse. That's what we know. But we also know the opposite is true. When people lose their right to make choices or their right to make choices is ignored or taken away from them, their lives get worse. People with disabilities who make less choices are found to be more passive, have lower self-esteem and decreased ability to function. What we know though, is that with more choice comes better quality of life. People with disabilities are more likely to be employed. They're more likely to be integrated in their community. They're more likely to be independent when they make more choices. And for me, this is one of the biggest things up on your screen right now. Because one of the biggest things I hear people talk about all over the country about people with disabilities is the need to keep them safe. The need to keep them protected, them. And I put that in quotes because I always hear it like the disabled or them, not one single person. What well, I'll tell you is this. The studies show that with more self-determination comes more safety. Study up on your screen is one of many that showed that people with intellectual developmental disabilities, particularly women with IDD, who are exponentially more likely to be abused and neglected, when they have more self-determination, they're less likely to be abused. 
Jonathan, let me interrupt you real quick. We still have one or two people that need to mute to get rid of the feedback. And I relinquished that control when I made you host. So, okay, there we go. Thank you. Fantastic. So if we know all these things to be true, if we know that with more self-determination comes a better quality of life, if we know that with less self-determination comes a worse quality of life, the question is, where do we go? And I suggest it's this, and I believe this is something that everyone agrees with. If we know that with more self-determination comes a better life and with less comes a worse life, there's one more thing we have to agree on before we can move on. And that's this. People need help. Because I used People to go with disabilities well, I went need three help times only with every Ebony. day. And, you know, because I went, I, I used to go with her. Because I'm like, if you go, I'll go. I'm, I'm you sorry. Me, you're like, glasses. Yeah. And, I'm Penny? like, oh, no. But, and that's the other thing. Like, but we if you can tell me how I can mute from here, I'll be happy to do it. Sew up under the participants and Even hit the then, mute button. People, you can't move. And and I'm like, you just can't move. You can't do the steps that correctly. And, and, this, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm... Okay. Excellent. So where can we go? And that's this. We need to agree that people need help, that people with disabilities need help every day because we all need help every day. Look at the help I just needed muting the, uh, the, the sound effects. So help is something that is natural. And if we accept that help is what makes self-determination real, that we need to make sure that people have the help they need to exercise their rights to make choices effectively and safely, then we can move on because there is a way to go forward from here. And that is supported decision-making. I know with 10 slides in, I'm finally getting to the point. What supported decision-making is, and there's a definition up on your screen. I wrote it, feel free to screenshot it, but I'd much rather you ignore it. So I think it's overwritten. I think it's pseudo-intellectual claptrap, but for what it's worth, that's the one that appears in textbooks. But I can tell you what supported decision-making is this way. How do you make decisions? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you are faced with a, ch work, a, a challenge at work that you've never faced before? You go talk to a colleague, right? What do you do when you have an something in your personal life that you just don't know how to deal with? You talk to a friend for advice, right? What do you do when you, you don't feel well? You go to the doctor. What do you do when you need to figure out what to do with your car? You go to a mechanic. We all get help. And that is what supported decision-making is. It's getting the help you need to make the decisions you have to make and to make the best decisions for you. And if you think about it, we do that every day too. I mean, think about all of the cliches about supported decision-making. You don't know they're about supported decision-making, but you're gonna think about all the cliches and all the expressions you've probably used. Make an informed choice. Don't go off half caught. Don't make a snap decision. Get a second opinion. My dad's favorite saying was, if you measure twice, you only have to cut once. It all means the same thing. Before you make a decision, get the help you need to understand it and do something with it. That's what supported decision making is. And here's what we know, that when people with disabilities use supported decision making, instead of having someone else make decisions for them, we are finding that they're having more self-determination and a better life. That's not rocket science, is it? If we know that self-determination leads to a better quality of life, then if you are using supported decision making to make your own decisions, it makes sense that you have more self-determination and control over your life than if someone else made decisions for you. And we found that in a research study. In Virginia, we worked with young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities all over the spectrum of abilities, all over. Some had guardianship, some didn't. And what we did was we empowered them to use supported decision making by talking to them about it, by showing them ways they could use it. We said, go make a plan, you and your family, your friends, your supporters, and come back and tell me what it is. And once they did that, we said, go live your life according to your plan. And we did some interviews and collected some data. And here's what we found. Across the board, every single person who used supported decision making, we found they were more independent, more confident, and they felt better and made better decisions. They were better at making decisions. And according to the people in their lives, they made objectively better decisions. And even mid-pandemic, they had a better quality of life. They were doing more things. Why? They were more self-determined. Maybe that's why supported decision-making in just the last 10 years, just in the last 10 years, since I had the honor to represent a young woman named Jenny Hatch in the first trial to hold that a person had the right to use supported decision-making in just those 10 years, 23 states in Washington, D.C. have changed their laws to recognize formally 
supported decision making. Organizations like the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services have endorsed supported decision making. The American Bar Association, the National Guardianship Association, ASAN, NAMI, a statistics self advocacy network, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, several ARCs, and the National ARC chapter have endorsed supported decision making. So that's what the background is. And we, where do we go from there? How do we take supported decision making into the realm of healthcare and life planning and person centered planning? Well, to do that, first thing we have to think about is, is what the law says. And what's on your screen is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's one of the sections of it that really says it as well as it can be said. Just having a disability, physical and mental, does not, should not, and cannot diminish your right to be a full and active participant in society. Having a disability does not make you separate. It makes you equal. So you have a full right to do everything anyone else can do. And that's great, but it's a problem when it comes to healthcare. So what we know is people with disabilities don't get equal healthcare. We know from studies that people with disabilities are often over-treated, under-treated, under or over-medicated. And we know a lot of times one of the driving forces helping or putting people with disabilities into guardianship where they lose their rights are a doctor recommending it or a doctor refusing to treat a person unless they have a guardianship. And they always say the same thing to me. And I, I want you to think about this. Doctors always say that they can't use supported decision making with their patients or they won't or they won't treat a patient because they feel the patient can't give informed consent. A person with disabilities can't give informed consent to treatment because of their disabilities. And I always ask them what they mean by informed consent. Because when you hear that phrase, does it mean you have to understand every word? Do you read every word on the pill bottle when you get it? Of course you don't. Do you understand every single possible side effect of those pills? Of course you don't. You understand that your doctor has recommended that you take those pills to feel better. And then you take those pills. That's what informed consent is. The American Medical Association put it really well. There's three parts of informed consent. I, the patient, tell you what's wrong. This is why I don't feel well. This is what I want. This is how I want to feel better. You, the doctor, tell me what you recommend. These are the things I would do. This is my recommended treatment. And I have to understand that. Then I have to consider it and make a decision as to whether or not I want to do that. So three steps. I talk to the doctor. The doctor understands me. Doctor talks to me. I understand the doctor. I make a decision. The doctor hears my decision. That's what informed consent is. Well, all of that can be done through supported decision making. And in fact, you've probably done it. If you've ever gone to a doctor that's taught jargon at you, you've probably done what I've done. Well, you said, can you please explain that to me in, in plain language so I understand it? Stop talking jargon at me. And you've probably been in a situation where you have felt poorly and didn't want to make any major decisions without talking to someone. So what that tells us is two things. One, we can use supported decision making in all of these steps because they're all about understanding. So if I have someone there who I want to be there to help me understand the doctor, help the doctor understand me and help me make the decision, I can provide informed consent. Second thing we got to realize is that informed consent is a bit of a loaded term. Because when doctors say you with a disability cannot give informed consent, ask the question of what that means. Because that Ability fluctuates with how you feel during the day. It fluctuates with the help you have. It fluctuates with the information you have. Short version, when I go to the doctor, and I, I'm a big baby when it comes to going to the doctor, and I go to the doctor and I say to the doctor, please help me out here. Please help me out. Uh, I feel terrible. And the doctor says, take this pill. You have the flu. You'll feel better. I will take that pill because my doctor recommended it. I can't spell erythromycin. I don't know the difference between the thermomycin and the z pack Still, because my doctor recommended it and the doctor understood me and I understood my doctor, I can choose to take that pill. Another short version, if the doctor recommends heart surgery, I don't have to know what, 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 what it is. I don't have to know every step of the way to provide consent to it. So don't fall into that trap of thinking informed consent means understanding every word because what supported decision-making does is empower doctors and patients and families by improving communication and improving understanding. It allows for more work and better work between professionals, patients, and people with disabilities and their families. It's like the Administration on Community Living out of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says, we're all 
different, but we all need help. And what supported decision-making does is empower us to get the help we need in the best possible way that we can need it so we can do our best possible work and make our best decisions. So a doctor would, who otherwise might say, I can't treat you because you can't provide informed consent can say now this person gets it they have help i who might otherwise not understand my options can have the help i need to understand them and make the decisions family members and friends who might be worried about whether i'm able to make that decision or whether i'm going to understand everything can be in the room with me with my permission to help me understand so everyone benefits I benefit because I'm empowered to understand and make my decisions. Doctors benefit because they are empowered to have better faith that the person can make those decisions and better communication with their patients. And family members and friends benefit because they can be there to provide assistance. And it's easy to do. There are a million ways to empower supported decision-making. Um, it's as easy as getting a form, the form you get every time you go to the doctor and putting a name on it for decision-making. It's as easy as going to supporteddecisionmaking.org and use one of the model forms there that says, these are the people I want to help me, and this is what I want. Now, warning, if you do attempt supported decision-making in a doctor's office, it's entirely possible the doctor will say, I can't do that. I can't do it because I can't have a third person in the room. I can't violate my patient's right to privacy or the law that's called HIPAA. I'm sure you've heard of HIPAA. Doctors will say, I can't have a supporter in the room because HIPAA says I can't share information about my patient. Well, if you hear that, if you hear it, one, realize it's not necessarily wrong. HIPAA does say that the doctor can't give away your medical information. But here's what it really says. It says you can't, the doctor can't share your information without your permission. That means you, the patient, have the power to give permission to the doctor to share that information with someone else. HIPAA belongs to the patient. The right to privacy belongs to the patient. So if the patient wants a third party in the room, wants a supporter in the room, the third, the, the patient has the right to say, I want Jonathan there. I want Dina there. And give the doctor permission to share that information. Because sharing information is what supported decision-making is all about, right? I share information with the doctor. Doctor shares information with me. Supporters share information about me with the doctor and to me from the doctor. So it's all about sharing information. So we can use HIPAA then to empower supported decision-making. Here's how I mean. Every time doctors say this, and I present to a lot of doctors, every time some doctor says, we can't do supported decision-making because of HIPAA, and I mean every time, what I say is this, every time I go to the doctor, and I mean every time, I am giving a form to fill out. And that form is called something like privacy notice or HIPAA notice or, prior, or you know rights to privacy. They'll say the same thing. They say, it is the policy of our doctor's office not to share your information with anyone. We are not allowed to share information with anyone. And down at the bottom, it says, except this person you give, in, you give us permission to do, right? There's always a spot at the bottom of the form where you can authorize the doctor to share your medical records and information. So take that form, write in the name of a supporter and say, just put in words, um, I authorize for the purpose of helping me make decisions. Just like that. Just like that on the HIPAA form, when you say, I know you can't share my information without permission, but I'm giving you permission to share my information with this person I've named, just like that, you have created an enforceable supported decision-making agreement that gets around HIPAA because the patient is giving permission to use it. You can also go farther. You can create a formal authorization. You're all going to get copies of the slide deck. Feel free to share my, to steal my language. Well, you can just write, I authorize you, doctor, and I authorize you, supporter, to help me make decisions. And I want you, and there's a whole bunch of fancy lawyer language in there about the HIPAA's law and quoting it and blah, 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 but it all comes down to the same thing. I am giving my supporter permission to see my records and talk to my doctor. I am giving my doctor permission to talk to that supporter. Just like that, we have authorized supported decision-making. We can even get more formal. I am a huge fan of powers of attorney. 
because powers of attorney are legal documents that give someone else the power to do something. And we can use powers of attorney to create supported decision-making arrangements. Think about it this way. A power of attorney says, God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions for me. But we can use that in a supported decision-making context. We can say, even when you have power to make decisions for me, look at the bold language on the bottom of your screen. And again, steal my language. I'm giving you power to make decisions for me. But here's how you're going to use it. You're going to talk to me first. You're going to find out what I want to do first. And as much as you possibly can, you are going to do what I tell you to do. We can even get more detailed on this. Here's an example of a power of attorney that I did with someone who uh, was, was working with her mom and, and wanted very badly to have as much power to make her own decisions as possible. So what we did was we made a list of decisions that were important to that person and told in advance in the power of attorney what she would do in that decision. I never want uh, electroconvulsive therapy. I never want psychoactive drugs. I always want extraordinary measures taken. I always want to be consulted about my health care. And we went further than that. We said, if there's a decision to be made that's not on the list, then that person has to talk to the person with disabilities before making the decision and do what the person with disabilities says. And if the person with disabilities is in such a bad way that he or she can't communicate, then the person has to make the decision that she feels the patient would have made, even if it's something the person wouldn't have done him or herself. So a power of attorney like this is a perfect example of supported decision-making because I am giving you power but I'm telling you how it can be exercised. And you are going to exercise it collaboratively with me, listening to my preferences and following them whenever possible. And we can go you know, farther or simpler than this. Because what happens if you're not incapacitated? All of these things, a power of attorney really kicks in when something bad happens, right? When something bad happens that leaves me unable to make decisions. But what if we used language that said, I know that, but what about other times? Here's what I mean. Look at the screen. And again, the bold words. A power of attorney says, God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions for me. I want you to go to the doctor. But you can include language that says, God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions. But when even something hasn't happened, when everything is fine and I'm okay, I still want you to come to the doctor with me to help me communicate with the doctor and the doctor communicate with me. I'm authorizing you in this power of attorney to be in the room with me. And when you have that, you can simply print out that power of attorney, highlight that section, bring it to the doctor and say, from now on, Jonathan's coming with us to the doctor. The power of attorney authorizes that. That's how we can make supported decision-making work. I know that your state hasn't passed a law yet. There have been attempts, but you don't need a law to do that. With a power of attorney or a form like that, you can empower supported decision-making. And the same thing is true of person-centered planning. We see person-centered planning in Medicaid waivers and so many other places. Well, PCP is all about supported decision-making. What I just pulled for you comes directly from Medicaid.gov. It's their guideline for what powers for what person-centered planning should be. Take a look, take a look at it. Person-centered planning should create a plan that addresses what the person wants based upon the person's goals. And then it says, we are gonna have a plan that touches all these areas in this person-centered plan about the person's goals. And if you've ever been through the training on person-centered planning, you know what that means. And again, coming directly from Medicaid, where they say it should involve a person and people of that person's choosing so that they may work together. Well, that just means finding out what's important to the person and what's important for the person. Both you as a case manager or a professional and everyone in that person's life who they invite, helping that person understand their options, understand what services and supports may be available, understand what their goals and objectives may be, where they are now, where they want to be, who's in their life now and who they want in their life. That's how you make a person-centered plan. So the person works with the team the case manager, other professionals, family members, whoever is there. So the person can understand his or her options and choose the ones that fit best for them. And doesn't that sound like supported decision-making? Isn't that exactly what we were talking about? 
people working with friends and their family members to understand their options and make choices. That's what person-centered planning is. It's working with your team and making the decisions you feel you have to make in a way that reflects what you want to do. And there's so many other areas where you can get supports and services to make SDM work and provide opportunities for people to learn about it. One of them is Centers for Independent Living. I'm a huge fan of Centers for Independent Living or SILs. What a SIL is there to do, and it's federally funded, a SIL is there to help people with disabilities and older adults understand and find services and supports that will help them live effectively in the community and maximize their self-determination. If you don't know what your local SIL is, there's a link on your screen where you can find the SIL serving your community. I love SILs because they can do so many things. Up on your screen is what they are specifically authorized to do by federal law. Provide independent living skills training, receive counseling, provide housing services, psychological counseling, personal assistance services, and other things necessary to help people be as self-determined and independent as possible. In other words, SILs can do just about anything. They can help people understand and get the services and supports that they need. Now, when it comes to supported decision-making, what a perfect opportunity. Because the majority of employees of a SIL must be themselves people with disabilities. So if you're working with a SIL as a person with disabilities, you can receive what's called peer counseling, working with someone who has been in your situation or the situation the person you support. In other words, you can be learning supported decision-making from people who've used it their whole lives and have an active opportunity to use it with them so that you can advance together and understand and implement SDM together. One more thing I want to talk to you about medical decisions that I think is pretty important is you may hear about a service called shared decision-making. And I want to make sure that if you hear it, you understand what it means. I, I, I'm going to confess I'm not a huge fan of shared decision-making, and I'll tell you why, but it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean it should never be used. It just means that you should be aware of it. So here's the thing about supported decision-making. The supported decision-making we've been talking about is a person making choices for him or herself with the support of people they choose. I get to make the final call. I talk to you, I get your advice, I make the final decision. Well, you know what that means? That means sometimes you are gonna recommend that I make a certain decision and I'm gonna say, no, I'm gonna do it this other way. I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all gotten advice we haven't followed. We just chose to go another way. Well, the same is true for all of us in medical care. Our doctors make a recommendation for treatment. They tell us you should do this or you should do that. Sometimes people don't agree. It may not be the best course for their health, but sometimes people don't agree. They say, I'm not going to do what my doctor recommends. There's a term for that. It's called making a decision against medical advice or AMA. And making a decision, AMA, is your right to do. You have the right to say, thank you, doctor. I've heard you. I understand. I don't want to go that way. Nothing wrong with that. It may not be the best thing to do, but it certainly is within your rights to do. Well, here's the difference with shared decision-making and supported decision-making. In shared decision-making, you may hear it called shared DM or even SDM. In shared decision-making, the healthcare professional, the doctor, whomever, gives the person information about his or her recommendations, information about what they think the person should do. And then the person is supposed to try to make, understand it and make a decision. And that sounds just like supported decision-making until we get to here. In shared decision-making, the person's decision is only honored if the doctor agrees with it. In other words, the doctor has a veto power over the person's rights. And the difference between shared decision-making and supported decision-making is in shared decision-making, you can't make a decision AMA. You lose the right to make your own decision unless the doctor agrees with you. Dana, I saw you put your hand yeah, up. So we have a question that I'm going to read to you because it's probably pertinent right now. This lady has uh, two sons uh, that point to letters on a communicate point to letters on a letter board to communicate in AAC. There are times that the, the AAC has come under scrutiny, um, but this is how her sons communicate. Um, any advice to doctors or to the individuals on allowing this method? Yeah, doctors use that method all the time. If you've been in an ER at any point in the last several years, 
you'll see in the ER, I've seen it in every hospital I've ever been to, there's a sign up on the wall that's supposed to help you identify your pain level. It's a series of faces going from happy to sad. So the person can say, if a person's not able to communicate, a person can say how they feel with that sign. That's AAC right there. That's supported decision-making right there. So there should be no difference in a way the person communicates if the person is communicating his or her decisions. And what I would say is this, if, if a person's using a letter board, and, and this, this one hits me personally because my uncle communicated for his entire life through a letter board and did it very, very well. If that's come under scrutiny, one, I would consider finding another doctor. But two, if it really is questioned, then start gathering evidence that that's what the children do. Um, start getting like records saying that this is how it happens. And when in doubt, videotape it. This is showing communication. Um, communication does not equal speech. Anybody who's ever heard the phrase body language knows that. There are many ways to communicate, and some people are not traditionally verbal. And if a doctor thinks that being not traditionally verbal equals being unable to think, I question whether that person is a very good doctor. I'd consider finding another one. So that's my first piece of advice. I'm sorry for the snark. My second is, if you think that's going to be a problem, start gathering evidence. This is what's done. A doctor's note, for example, a supporter's note, the person who taught them to use the letter board saying, I, I certify that Jonathan uses a letter board to communicate or a video showing it. Um, I have a friend in California who did powers of attorney almost entirely by using letter boards with her children. So again, to me, it's a very personal topic and I hope that helped out. Dean, is there any other questions? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. So getting back to shared decision-making, the difference between shared DM and supported decision-making is that in supported decision-making, I make the decision and it goes from there. I'm the final decision-maker. In shared decision-maker, I'm not because the doctor can veto my decision if he or she doesn't agree with it. So what I want to leave you with on that is one, to know the difference because you might hear someone say, we're going to use SDM. I'd recommend saying, what does that mean to you? But there's nothing wrong or illegal about it. Some people, and particularly people with psychiatric disabilities, may prefer it. They may feel that this is not, sometimes I'm not able to make the best choices. It's good to have this. So nothing wrong with it, but be aware of it. And the main message is that there's many, many, many ways to make decisions. And as long as they empower the person to the maximum extent possible, they're good things. Just be aware of the options for them. Next thing I want to talk to you about is my favorite Medicaid program, and it's one for children. I don't know if you've heard the phrase before, but if you haven't, if you work with children on Medicaid, if your child is on Medicaid, if you are someone under 21 years old receiving Medicaid, you need to know these letters. EPSDT stands for Early and Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. It is my favorite program for children. Let me give you some, let me give you some information on EPSDT. And to do it, the first thing I have to do is give you a little background on Medicaid. Here's a little background on Medicaid. Here's how Medicaid works. I'm the federal government, Dina, you're Florida, okay? And what I do is I come up to you with a dump truck full of money. And I say, would you like to be part of the Medicaid program? If you would, I have a dump truck full of money for you. But if you do want that dump truck full of money, there are things you have to do. There are services and supports you have to provide. I call that column A. Column A supports are mandatory for every state participating in Medicaid. Things like um, augmented assistive technology, things like um, durable medical equipment, maternal and child health care. But I also come up to you, Dina, and say, I've got a second dump truck full of money. This is money that you don't have to take to participate in Medicaid. But if you do, you're able to authorize additional services. We're going to call those column B. There's stuff in column B you can do if you want. And if you decide to do them, I'm going to give you money to get them done. But you don't have to decide to do them. You just don't take the money. Every state participates in Medicaid. All of them are doing all of the column A stuff. But it varies state to state on whether anyone has taken the column B money. That's your background on Medicaid. Because the purpose of EPSDT is to help people identify as a child supports they need before they're an adult. Because remember what I said, states don't have to provide column A and column B. Got to provide A, they don't have to provide B. But if you are a child receiving Medicaid, then you are entitled 
do everything in column A and everything in column B, regardless of whether your state provides it. So I give an example on your screen of two states, Ohio and Virginia. If a person receives Medicaid, a person under 21, then they are entitled to everything that could conceivably be covered. So a child in Ohio is entitled to everything that could conceivably be covered, even if Ohio doesn't cover it. If a person in Ohio wants adaptive exercise equipment to help her, he or she walk better, and Ohio doesn't cover that, but Texas does, then that Ohioan is entitled to what she could have gotten in Texas, even if Ohio doesn't authorize it for adults. Here's another example for you. I'm from Virginia. I've worked in Virginia. And when I was working in this area in Virginia, Virginia did not cover dental pro uh, programs. Dental is a column B item. Virginia did not have to cover it. So what happened was the only dental procedures they covered were extractions. So, and I saw this, wards of people with disabilities in state-run homes and institutions who had no teeth because it was the only thing Medicaid covered. Virginia has since changed that, but go back to that time when Virginia only covered extractions for adults. However, children receiving Medicaid were entitled to receive dental care because other states covered it. That's how EPSDT works. So that's huge because if you're working with a child receiving Medicaid who needs supports and services to increase their independence, to improve their self-determination, to improve their decision-making, to improve their independent living skills, then they should receive them even if Florida doesn't cover them as long as another state does. And yeah, I know it means doing some research into other states, but imagine what this means. This means every, every kind of support and service, every therapy, everything you've ever heard of, if another state covers it, you can get it for a child if the child is receiving Medicaid. And it's even more important when it comes to the special education context, because I hear all the time from parents and professionals that they know there is something that a child needs that a school won't provide, or a school will provide very little of, only two hours of physical therapy when everyone knows it should be 10 or 12. And the school always says the same thing, we can't afford it. They won't say that publicly, but they'll tell you privately, we don't have the funds to provide that. Well, here's where EPSDT really kicks in. If a school becomes a Medicaid provider, they go to Medicaid and say, we will be a Medicaid provider, then here's how EPSDT works. Anything in the student's individualized education program that is medical in nature is covered by federal EPSDT dollars. The school doesn't have to pay for it. So a student needing a support or a service or a therapy can get it as long as they are a Medicaid recipient and the school is a Medicaid provider. Dina, I saw your hand. What can I answer? Okay, so we have a couple questions that probably will pertain to this. One is how does the EPSDT apply to Florida's home and community-based waiver service? The way it usually works and the way I'm pretty sure it works in Florida is EPSDT is the payer of last resort. The exception to that is what's on your screen right now. EPSDT is the payer of first resort in school. But with regard to a waiver, the way EPSDT works is before you hit EPSDT dollars, you have to exhaust other forms of insurance. So if it's something that's not covered by a waiver, you get a denial under the waiver, you can go to EPSDT. In fact, most Medicaid programs in states communicate with each other. They shift it over to EPSDT if the waiver doesn't cover it. So the way I want you to think about it is if it's something that is coverable under a waiver, you hit the waiver first. However, if it's something that's only partially coverable or hits an, uh, a cap on pay, then you go to the cap and the remainder you go to EPSDT. As long as what you're looking for can be characterized as medical in nature, and it's going to fix a problem, help a problem, keep a problem from getting worse. If it does those things, then EPSDT will supplement the waiver or private insurance, but you got to hit those first. Other question? Other question has to do with power of attorney. Power of attorneys can be found in trust. They're off, they often use the word incapacitated. How would a power of attorney be constructed, worded for an individual who is cognitively impaired? Here's and how I do it. And I've written these this way. 
is I say that they're correct. A power of attorney kicks in when a person is quote unquote incapacitated. You can define what that means in the power of attorney itself. Now, I strongly recommend you talk to a Florida attorney about this. I am not a Florida attorney. I, I'm from Virginia, like I said, so I have to cover my butt by saying I'm not giving you legal advice. Talk to a Florida attorney, but here's what I do in cases where I am involved in it. I will say exactly what you said. The power of attorney kicks in when the person is incapacitated. But we define incapacitated by saying a person is considered incapacitated if two doctors say that this person is not able to make decisions, even with support, even using supported decision making. So that gives you a definition of incapacitated. Dr. One, Dr. Two agree that Jonathan now cannot make decisions. He could before, he can't now, and he can't do it even if he gets support and even if he uses SDM. That way you are building in the requirement to try to use support, you are recognizing the availability of supported decision making, and you are also giving a little protection to the person before someone else gets the right to make decisions. We have to have not one, but two doctors say it and consider SDM. That's how I'd recommend doing it, but please do talk to a, a lawyer that you work with to see if that's viable or that's what his or her advice would be. Other questions? Um, thoughts on healthcare power of attorney? Big fan. I mean, in fact, uh, that's one of the examples I gave earlier. I think healthcare powers of attorney are great because we can be very specific with them. We can use a healthcare power of attorney to identify specific decisions, and we can use it to be very specific about when support is to be used. We use that support when the person needs it. And if the person's incapacitated, we use supported decision making even then. So I love the medical powers of attorney because like this one says, even when I'm not incapacitated, I'm authorizing you to come to help me. What this one says is even when I am incapacitated, you will work with me to make decisions and give primary consideration to what I want. And in fact, here's a list of decisions that you're going to have to comply with when I make my own choice, even when I am incapacitated. Other questions? Uh, one was the law that you referred to that Florida did not pass. Yeah, a bill was submitted to the legislature to authorize supported decision making by name as an alternative to guardianship. It did not pass, last right. to my knowledge. But what I will say, and again, remember, this is not a guardianship presentation, but that doesn't mean that people can't use supported decision making in Florida because your law says a person cannot be put into guardianship unless it is shown that the person can't make decisions or that there are no quote unquote less restrictive options. Well, supported decision-making is a less restrictive option and with it, a person can make decisions if they can. So even though not mentioned by name, it still applies. And I can tell you this from personal experience. I just had a case in Michigan, literally just, where a person was trying to get out of guardianship because she uses supported decision-making. And the judge was very concerned. He, he said, we don't have a law that recognizes this. Other states have laws that say supported decision-making is an alternative. What I pointed out was two things. One, that the law in Michigan, like the law in Florida, says that a person should not go into guardianship unless they're unable to make decisions and unless there's no other options. Well, supported decision-making is an option. And I also cited about 40 different cases from states that didn't have supported decision-making laws where the judge said supported decision-making is appropriate, it is consistent with our law, and therefore that person either doesn't go into guardianship or comes out. And that judge wrote the first opinion in the history of Michigan, finding that supported decision-making is an option and freeing that person from guardianship. It got a fair amount of press attention up there, but it's the kind of thing that shows the power of supported decision-making. This person didn't have rights, and then she did. And the thing was, it was her guardian that said, we want to use supported decision-making. It was a sister who became her guardian when she was struggling. And when she was able to do better, when she was able to make her own decisions, the guardian said, my favorite thing in guardianship. Good news, judge. I did my job. You can fire me because I helped my sister learn. And now the sister is, is living. She's living her life and making her own decisions. So that's my answer on the law. Laws are great, but they supported decision-making laws are great. I have been in favor of them. I'm speaking at a rally in North Carolina next week in favor of one. 
but it, they're not mandatory. We can incorporate supported decision making without a law, and we should. Other questions? Uh, none at this time, but just a uh, 12 minute warning on time. Well, I can talk for at least 15 more. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions, by the way, offline as well. One more thing I think is very important to put in all of your stuff in every power of attorney, every, every plan. I call it a growth clause where I say we're going to take a really deep dive into this power of attorney, this plan once a year. And we're going to see if it's needed. We're going to see what's needed. And I know that's required for an individualized service plan under a waiver anyway, but I mean a really deep dive looking at what the person can and can't do, what the person does and doesn't want. Using that supported decision making, working with that person's peers and supporters and family members to really suss out where the person does and doesn't want support. There's a hand up from uh, Kaya Rodriguez. Kaya, yeah, Kaya, go ahead. Yeah, okay. um, I was just Googling the, the other day. I was trying to figure out the, you know, Medicaid law for Laurel Lee's legislative aid because they were playing hooky with me and they didn't know where to find it. But I Googled something that was, it was the Florida statewide Medicaid waivers home com community-based services. I'm wondering if that's what I need to send them up in D.C. because they cannot find the bill anywhere. I know there's thousands of bills going through there. Well, but, um, I don't know the, if the bill is active. I know it was voted down last year or the year before. I don't know if there is a current SDM bill in your legislature. Huh. Okay, because that's why she was playing hooky. But what I would like to see happen is the $2,000 mark. I feel needs to be more cushioned. Of course, I'm involved because of Patty Rendon, but still, you know, they were trying to do some research up there. Um, you mean perfect. the two thousand the $2,000 resource limit for waivers and SSI, SSDI? I guess that's what it would be. I'm not even sure yeah. if it's SSDI or whatever that. As a general rule, people receiving public benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, SSI, SSDI, food stamps, cannot have more than $2,000 of assets or they wow. risk losing their benefits. It's called the wow. fiscal cliff. People are afraid to work because they might go over the fiscal cliff. We're going way beyond this presentation, but I'll be happy to talk to you offline. One of the ways to address that, and by the way, I agree that the $2,000 limit should be raised, but there are ways to get around it. And one of them that is my favorite is called an ABLE account. Mm -hmm. okay. A special account a person can open, Florida has them, where you can put up to $15,000 a year Wow. Tax-free. You can have up to $102,000 in it without it impacting your benefits. So and I'm a huge fan of it. A, just a little plug. Our May Lunch and Learn will have John Finch with Able United speaking on that. So that oh. topic will be covered next month. It's, okay. a great, it's a great topic. You can also learn more about Able Accounts at the National Resource Center for Able Accounts, uh, ablenrc.org. Able NRC National Resource Center.org. Lots of great info on Florida's ABLE accounts and, and every other state's ones. Okay. And finally, this goes mm -hmm. through end of life planning as well. If you're not talking end of life planning with the people in your life, you're doing them a disservice. I know it sounds icky. You don't want to talk about dying when a person's alive. But I can tell you from personal experience, specifically my father, that when he was nearing the end, having some control over things like extraordinary measures and everything up to what's what he wanted played at his service, whether he wanted the service, what readings, what music, etc. It gave him a little control over something no one has control over. So if for no other reason, it's a great time to use supported decision making. There are free services out there, the conversation, five wishes, just Google end of life planning. And it allows you to have a conversation. It's a facilitated conversation to talk about with the person what they want as they reach the end of their journey. I know it's actually required as part of person-centered planning, and I know a lot of people don't do it. Um, it's not icky. It gives people power. And giving people power and people control and self-determination, like I said, 40 years of research says that makes for a better life. So this is where I want to end with you. I'm happy to answer any questions, but this is where I want to end. The things we just talked about today, using supported decision-making in healthcare, having new authorizations, talking to doctors about making sure people can make their own decisions, they are new. They are relatively new in our world. And it's going to be um, a, a tough slog if you're an advocate. These things that we talk about, though, are real, and they provide real benefits to people. So we have to start, as I know that you already know, so I'm preaching to the choir, but we have to start with, with, with respecting people's rights. 
starting with people have the right to make choices and finding ways to empower that rather than asking people to show that they can or earn the right to make choices. And I, I, I've been very honored to work with the ARC of Florida and, and several ARCs in a number of situations. And it's something that I know is a value that goes through the entire organization. Um, I've known Alan since before he was with the ARC. I've worked with others and I'm, I'm blown away by the commitment you have. So this is, I'm sure, a bedrock value of yours. So that makes things even more important when you get pushback, because you will get pushback. You're going to get people saying, this is the way we've always done things. This is the way we're going to keep doing things. You can't make us change the way we're doing things. The way I answer that and the way I beg you to answer that is this. We've always done it this way is the worst reason to do anything. We as a people have changed the world time and again by changing the way things had always been done. Think about it. In 1774, the 13 colonies had always been British. She fought a war and we changed it. In 1863, where you are sitting and where I live in Virginia, some people thought they could own other people. We changed that. In 1918, half the population women didn't have the right to vote. We changed that. In 1962, you could be denied service at a restaurant or not be allowed to use a water fountain based on the color of your skin. We changed it. In 1989, people with disabilities were not considered in a legal sense to be people. We changed that. So we've always done it. It is not a good argument against anything. The our best argument is we can do better. Because in all those examples, we did better. And the problem you're also going to face is pushback. You are going to hear from people because making decisions means you might make some bad ones. I've made some bad ones. You've made some bad ones. But you're not people with disabilities. When you make a bad decision, people call it a learning experience or teachable moment. When people with disabilities make, make bad decisions, people start saying they shouldn't have the right to make decisions. So it's hard to do the things that we're talking about. It's hard when the pushback happens. But here's a little secret that I know you already know also. <laughs> it ain't easy to do advocacy. It's not easy to be an advocate for people with disabilities. It's not easy to be a professional. But who, whoever told you it's going to be easy? You all professionals did not get into this field because it's easy. Parents, you know it's not easy to be a parent of a person with disabilities because you have to be so much more than a parent. You're the educational advocate, the healthcare professional, et cetera, et cetera. People with disabilities know damn well it's not easy because society is always looking down at you. So no one ever said it was going to be easy to you. You didn't get into this field because it's easy. You sure as hell didn't get into it for the money. So you got into it to do the right thing. And that is what my favorite author, the quote up on your screen, makes so clear. Nobody ever promised it would be easy, but that's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is not ease. The purpose of life is to choose and to act upon our choices. When we do that, when we respect choice, when we protect choice, when we reinforce choice, we are giving people the right that we have, including the right to make bad decisions. So you're not going to be judged, and people should not be judged by their bad decisions. They should be judged by who they are, how hard they work, and how many times they get up when they've been knocked down. Every advocate knows, every person with disability knows you're going to get knocked down. What supported decision-making does is say you can get up and you can get the help you need. And if we do that, we change the world. A cliche, I know, but a real one. Every professional got into this field to change the world. Parents want to change the world for your children. People with disabilities want to change the world. Well, this is how we can. If you empower one person to make more decisions in their life, and you've changed that person's life. You've also changed the life of everyone who comes after that person because it gets easier the next time you do it. My first supported decision-making case took a year and more than a week of trial. My next one took a day. And now most of the time, I don't even go to court because we know that this stuff works. We have the research for it. So it gets easier when you do it. And that's important. And I'm going to leave you with this and I'm almost out of time. When you do this, when you enforce choice, when you protect choice, you make choice more available, it becomes better time after time after time. And that's the key because we shouldn't be talking about supported decision-making for people with disabilities. We should be talking about decision-making by people because we all need that support. And if you buy into that, and if you're on this webinar, I'm sure you do. If you buy into the idea, the concept, the necessity of choice, 
then you can change people's lives and you can change the world. And if you don't buy in, my fondest wish for you is that you die suddenly. <laughs> and it's not a joke. It's not a joke. Because unless you die suddenly, unless you're hit by a truck and have a heart attack, whatever, unless you die suddenly, guess what you're going to be someday? You're going to be the person with disabilities. You're going to be old. You're going to be considered weaker or less than. You're going to be in the system. What kind of system you want to be in? You want to be in one that empowers you or the one that takes away your rights? One that supports you, one that doesn't believe you can do anything? Well, I think I know the answer. So for the people you support, for the people in your family, for the people you care about and for yourselves, we can and we should change the world. Be my honor.